Hello there, YouTube. I am Necrostevo. Today, we have a battle in the Pokemon Premier League Season 2 versus Shroom Raver and the Parasect Germain. Now, the first part of the video, of course, will be reviewing the team that I used in the matchup, and there will be a timestamp in case you want to jump straight into the action. Of course, thank you so much for being here with me today. And you'll notice right away some immediate upgrades because I got past this wonderful DLC2 prep doc. Uh, this was a document that was actually created um, by Ballhawk. And I believe KJ also did some updates on it too. So thank you very much to um, I don't remember who gave it to me first. It was either Onesie or Dave or... Name that you know me by. Which is Mr. B. But thank you for passing it to me because it immediately elevated my ability to look at the teams. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I uh, have a little bit of a different method for when I'm preparing for battles. Number one, I write down my teams in my notebooks. And number two, I just like to take like a copious amounts of notes when I'm doing things. So having a secondary way to really visualize the matchup was very beneficial. And you guys get this handy graphic whenever I am talking about the matchup for the team prep here. So you can see that my opponent, Shroom Raver, he and I have battled several times over the years and he and I go way back. So I knew to make sure that I brought some um, just a little bit of extra spice for this battle. He's coming to this battle with Garchomp, Mew, Enamorous Incarnate, Sinistra that can Terra into Ghost, Steel, or Fairy, Fortress, Entei, Raikou, Hitmonchan, Zangoose, um, the Arbok, and the Stone Journer. Zangoose can also Terra into uh, Normal, or Fighting, or Ghost. So. Two very powerful Terra Captains there, both of them very viable for this matchup. Now right away, you'll notice that he has a fire type in Entei, and Entei would love to hit my team in the sun. I ended up going with this matchup with Clefable with a very maximum defense set. I ended up going Calm Mind, Moonlight, Flamethrower, and Moonblast with heavy duty boots and unaware. That is just in case he tries to set up with the Mew or the Garchomp, or the Zangoose, and to a lesser extent, the Hitmonchan and the Arbok. All these are physical threats that can set up against my team, and having unaware Clefable with Moonlight and the Sun will give me some great recovery, and uh, unaware, of course, would ignore my opponent's stat boost, and each of those Pokemon that can set up, Clefable can hit pretty hard, barring the Arbok. That is number one here. Clefable also gives my team a really decent lead just to set up Stealth Rocks early. Uh, I was worried about there being hidden Focus Sashes here and there because if a Pokemon comes in with full HP and it has a Focus Sash and it's hit, even if it would knock it out, that Focus Sash will keep it alive with one HP. So I was worried about that and I wanted to break that. The next thing that I was bringing to this matchup is my Galarian Slowking. Here I have an excellent matchup because really his only ways to hit it really hard are the obvious ground type Garchomp or an Amorous Therian with uh, Earth Power. He could also carry something like extra sensory on his Raikou or um, really strong ground type moves from maybe the Stone Journer. The Sinistra you would think being a ghost type would hit it really hard, but with max HP and max Special defense, that's right, we're going max max on both this week. That means that the Sinistra really isn't a threat unless it sets up with Calm Mind. If he elects to set up with Calm Mind, I am bringing Sludge Bomb and Earthquake, Chili Reception and Toxic Spikes on my Galarian Slow King. You might ask why Toxic Spikes on a team when he has a grounded poison type, but I did not foresee Arbok coming to this matchup. Arbok really struggles to take hits from my team, and even if it comes with it like Intimidate to try to block some of my more physical attackers, I have so many different ways to hit it and outspeed it that if it tried to do something like a scale shot set to set up, I can just really overwhelm it. So I didn't see Arbok coming to this match. 
Arbok also doesn't have a good way to hit Galarian Slowking um, for very much damage, and so I figured I could always just use my own Earthquake against it. Earthquake also helps in case Sinistra Terra is into the Steel type, whereas the Sinistra Terra types into Fairy, I can just use Sludge Bomb. Earthquake gives me a way to hit something like Assault Vest Raikou or something like a Choice Specs Raikou that's locked into something else that's not Shadow Ball against my Galarian Slowking. I can hit it with that Earthquake and do a lot of damage. Even without any offensive investment in Earthquake, Earthquake can break any substitute on Raikou and it gives me a clean way to two hit KO, um, something like a Terra, uh, Steel, Sinistra. But really I don't have to do big damage with Slowking, I just need to get it in, set up Toxic Spikes, and then chip away at a few things. The reason why I need things chipped down is number one, if I don't have any entry hazards up, I, I just foresee some Focus Sashes in here. Also things like the Fortress and the Mew can take a lot of hits. Um, also Mew, for those of you who don't know, it can learn any TM in the game. And hilariously, I actually prepped my entire team and for some reason, I uh, this was before I got past the dock, by the way, but I prepped my entire team and then I was looking at the matchup again and I noticed that I had written down Mew, but I had done the whole team prep digitally and I hadn't looked back at my notes. And I was like, why did I write down Mew? That's interesting. And I went and I looked and Shroom Raver had drafted a Mew and I had not prepped for it. On the other side though, it's kind of hard to prep for Mew just because it can run so many different sets defensively and offensively. And so I decided to honestly kind of ignore it in my team building. I ran some counts to make sure that um, my offensive Pokemon could hit it hard enough. And I was like, I'm just gonna try to whittle that thing down if it, if it comes. I, I'm, if I see it right away, maybe Clefable can set up on it. But uh, I figured if I see it right away, it's probably gonna set entry hazards. If I see it later on, um, probably gonna try to do more damage. So I was like, we'll deal with that Mew when it shows up. Mew's normally invisible when it's hanging around anyway. So the next thing that I brought was Mysa Titan. Here I brought the Belly Drum Maximum Attached Set with Belly Drum, Ice Shard, Earthquake, and Knockoff. For this matchup, all I need are Ice Shard and Earth uh, Earthquake. I don't really even need Knockoff. Knockoff is nice just on the off case something weird happens, but and here, Ice Shard hits everything on the first row. It hits everything on the second row, except for the Fortress, which does not like Earthquake. Um, and then the Entei goes down to the Earthquake as well. And then everything else I can Ice Shard. Um, the reason why Ice Shard is important here is because look at his priority options. So on his team, you can learn priority moves. Entei gets extreme speed. Technically, the Zangoose and the Hitmonchan both get priority moves as well. So we had a lot of priority options here, but they are almost all physical priority moves. If the snow is up, so Titan's defense gets boosted by 50%. And after my Citrus Berry, that means I'd be at 75% if I use Belly Drum and cut my HP in half, and then I got my Citrus Berry back. So I put max attack, but then a lot into defense. I put 98 into my defense, leaving 160 points in speed just in case he brought a Scarf Samurott. Uh, that was the only thing that I was worried about because Samurott can use Sacred Sword and that would cl slice cleanly through any sort of defensive boost that I had there. Now here, if I get up um, a Belly Drum and the Fortress is still alive, that might be slightly annoying because he could just Gyro Ball me in the, in the snow. Uh, with the Titan Slush Rush ability, my speed gets doubled. So, um, Really all I needed was Ice Shard. If I can get off a of Belly Drum and get up Ice Shard, then this game is good to go. Now, what if I'm not able to Chili Reception into Satitan? What can I do to play around that? Well, it's time to bring Zeb Strika off the bench with an Expert Belt Sap Sipper set. Sap Sipper allows me to come in on a possible Matcha Gacha um, coming from the Sinistra. Granted, it's probably a poor idea to swap this Zebra in on it because he could just Shadow Ball and that would blow poor Zeb Strika away. With Expert Belt, I decided to go for pure coverage. We're gonna Terra type into the Ice type with max attack and max speed and four special attack. With horse, uh, high horsepower, Terra Blast, Overheat, and Super Cell Slam. Now with this Zep Strika, of course, you can see the speed tiers on the screen. 
I outspeed his entire team with Zeb Stryka, so it would just be kind of silly to not bring it. And this will also allow me to see if he has something Scarfed, whether uh, I could see Scarf Enamorous coming, Scarf Garchomp wouldn't be horrible, um, Scarf Raikou or Specs Raikou, Scarf Entei. <laughs> he just has so many things that he can bring Scarf. And so I, I want to be able to punish him if he does not have the Scarf on the right Pokemon. In the last two slots, I did decide to go with the regular Sun mode for my team. I was hesitant to bring this because Sun does power up Entei Sacred Fire, but I also figured Torkoal is my swap into Entei anyway, and so I can just yawn it if it's here, and we'll go from there. So Torkoal, I did go max HP, max defense as well to match the Clefable. Max HP, max defense allows me to be a secondary check to something like the Zangoose, the Hitmonchan, uh, I don't need any investment to beat the Fortress with my um, Torkoal. Uh, it does allow me to check the Entei very nicely. And um, if he happens to go physical on Mew, which I did not foresee here, I could check that as well. On my Torkoal, I ran Lava Plume, Yawn, Rapid Spin, and Solar Beam. Because with Lava Plume, that gives me a safe move to throw off and try to fish for burns. I really wanted burns on anything that I could take them on. Especially if, uh, for example, an Amorous came that is not affected by the toxic spikes because it's a flying type. So if I could snag a burn on it, that would also help cover for any sort of contrary superpower set that he has there. Yawn is my default move to deal with the Entei. I could have run Scorching Sands or Earth Power, but um, I really wanted to just force the Entei out. So every time I get an opportunity, I'm going to swap in my Torkoal on the Entei and then click Yawn for the most part. Um, after that, Rapid Spin, just because I, with Fortress and the Samurott, I just really didn't want to deal with Hisui and Samurott stacking up all those different hazards on me. Such a pain. Solar Beam gives me a really solid way to hit Hisui and Samurott, which is excellent. But, um, yeah, I just, I don't, I did not want to deal with that. Ceaseless Edge from Hisui and Samurott sets up spikes at the same time as doing dark damage. And so while I knew my um, my Torkoal could take the hits, I just I anticipated getting Entry Hazard stacked myself. So my only goal was really to get up the Toxic Spikes, but uh, that's why I put the Heavy Duty Boots on Clefable. And um, I ended up going with the Heavy Duty Boots on Torkoal as well, just because I didn't want to deal with the Entry Hazards on those two. In the final slot, we have Walking Wake with Choice Specs. And I adjusted the EV so that the Protosynthesis Boost so that way I functionally will have plus one speed and plus one special attack with the choice specs. I went with Hydro Steam, Flamethrower, Draco Meteor, and Dragon Pulse because he doesn't really have a swap in for Walking Wake. Like he can guess the 50-50 and try to bring in an Amorous and try to snag it in on, oh, he went for the Dragon move. But if I go for Hydro Steam, an Amorous is, is gone. Uh, same thing with something like the Mew or the Dragonite, and to a lesser extent, the Hisui and Samurott. They're all bulky enough to take a hit from the right move, but if I have the Protosynthesis boost, even if they have a Choice Scarf, I still outspeed every single one of them. Um, the only thing that I was worried about there is something um, like maybe going for a Draco Meteor and being at minus two, and then letting something like the Mew come in and set up. Mew could also be just really, really bulky and annoying, and um, fortunately Mew doesn't get recovery moves, but Mew could absolutely be specced here to take hits from Walking Wake, so that might be something that I had to wear down. Uh, he could also bring in the Fortress when I'm locked in on a Dragon move and set up entry hazards on me, so have to be careful clicking Draco Meteor, but I do think basically every time I click it, something dies. So that was the full team. In case you're joining me just now, right before the battle, we have Maximum HP and Maximum Defense Clefable with Heavy Duty Boots, with Calm Mind, Moonlight, Flamethrower, and Moonblast. Generally is a dedicated lead here, and I'm going to swap that out if I see an enamorous lead, uh, just because I don't want it taking so much damage. After that, we have Galarian Slowking with Heavy Duty Boots, Sludge Bomb, Earthquake, for the Raikou, and for a lesser extent, for the Sinistra terroring into a ghost type, Chili Reception, and Toxic Spikes. Slow King's main role here is to get up the Toxic Spikes, and so then look for an opportunity to use Chili Reception. And Slow King is max defense, uh, max special defense, and max HP with the sassy nature. After that, we have Satitan with the Citrus Berry, running 252 attack, 
98 defense and 160 speed for a Choice Scarf Samurott. Belly Drum, Ice Shard, Earthquake, and Knock Off. Really here, just get in after a Belly Drum and click Ice Shard every single time. It just blows things out of the water, bar the Entei and the, um, the Entei and the Fortress, and those get handled by Earthquake. After that, we have uh, Expert Belt Zeb Stryka, which outspeeds his entire team. That is running max attack and uh, speed with four and special attack with high horsepower, Terra Blast Ice, Overheat, and Supercell Slam. Walking Wake with Choice Specs and the Protosynthesis boost is for the speed with Hydro Seam, Flamethrower, Draco, Meteor, and Dragon Pulse. And then finally, Lava Plume, Yawn, Rapid Spin, and Solar Beam on a Torkoal, also running the Heavy Duty Boots with max HP and max defense. So we are going all in on the Thames this week. So thank you for checking out this quick team builder and it's time for the battle. Alrighty, so thank you all again. I just keep thanking you all. I have so much gratitude in me this week because I can feel it. Can you feel it? The darkness, the chilly reception that's coming. Mm, I just love it. You can see that Shroom Raver has brought his Mew, the Hisuian Samurott, the Garchomp, the Enamorous Incarnate Form, Sinistra, and Entei. With this lineup, I'm sticking to the game plan, and I'm going to lead with Clefable. Now, if he does lead with his um, Enamorous, that would constitute an immediate swap out into Galarian Slowking. We have to be careful with that because although Galarian Slowking can take some special hits, Enamorous can run Earth Power, and that would do a lot of damage to my Galarian Slow King. With max HP and max special defense, I'm always two hit KO'd if he's running like a Life Orb or a Choice Specs. But um, if he locked into the Earth Power like that, I would be able to tell that damage right away. And then I could swap to something else. Now, since he led with the Garchomp, I'm just going to hit it right away, expecting it to maybe be a Sash lead. Uh, he could also try to set up Substitute Swords Dance or something like that. I didn't want to predict too much right here. I could have gone straight for rocks, but I just wanted the damage immediately in case I needed to break a sash on this. Uh, he does swap out to the Entei immediately, and um, he took that relatively well for me not having any special attack investment. Clefable's no slouch on the special attacking side. And so here I'm like, uh, if he has Iron Head, he might click it, the sun's not up. Um, so I don't think he's going to click Sacred Fire. And so expecting him to go for Iron Head, I went into Torkoal, which does set up the sun, powering up his fire type moves. And he does go straight for Sacred Fire. So I possibly could have stayed in there unless he was Choice Banded. It just wasn't worth risking that early in the battle. Now right here, as I said before, if Torkoal comes in on the Entei, we click Yawn. So I immediately went to, for Yawn. And he does just go back off to Garchomp, which that's why I like the Yawn tech. So he could stay in here in Earthquake or set up some hazards or try to set up, but that means he's going to fall asleep if he stays in here. Now, I was very tempted right here to go to Walking Wake, expecting him to maybe go for Earthquake or possibly swap back to Entei. But I also didn't want to risk going in the Walking Wake and just taking a Dragon-type move um, for no reason. And so I went back to Clefable just as the safe switch. He does go back to Entei, and uh, since I went back to Clefable, I was like, okay, I'm not going to go back to Torkoal. That's a little bit too predictable. So I'm going to stay in here and click Stealth Rocks. Thinking, okay, if he goes for a Sun Boosted Sacred Fire, I can take that. And I really need to get up Stealth Rocks because we're already swapping around a lot. Based off of that damage, I was like, oh, that did a lot more than I thought it would. And then he flinches me, so I don't even get my Stealth Rocks out of the turn. But uh, that damage did not indicate Banded. And so I wasn't really sure what he was. If I figured if he... if He's going to stay in here and go for that again. I'm going to go out to Walking Wake now and resist the Iron Head. And um, that, if he didn't swap up moves, that would mean that he was probably Scarfed, is what I was thinking. So I go out to the Walking Wake, and now I'm underneath the sun. I get the speed boost, and I outspeed into either way. And I was thinking, what is he going to swap to? And I decided to go for Hydro Steam just because the sun is up. Again, this is a choice specs in the sun, Hydro Steam. And this does nothing to the Mew. <laughs> this did so little damage. 
And I was really disappointed by that. It kind of reminded me in my last week battle with Vepsis where I was like, all right, let's see the damage. And then Deoxys defense came in and took basically nothing. So I was like, is this an assault vested Mew? Did someone bring this suited up Mew versus me? Unfortunate. So we're gonna need to whittle down this Mew and not knowing what the Mew would really be doing, especially if it was Assault Vested, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna swap out. Maybe he'll try to set up spikes or something if he's not Assault Vested. And I, I, based on the calc, it really did seem like he was Vested to me. So he does just go straight for U-turn as I go back out to Clefable. I was hoping he would try to set up and I could recover my HP uh, if he stayed in there. Um, here, after a long time of thinking about it, I decided to go out into my Galarian Slowking because I figured he really was incentivized to just throw off a Moonblast here. He does go for Moonblast, and so I don't take that much damage, but I do get the special attack drop, which means Sludge Bomb no longer will KO Enamorous. Uh, he does take Life Orb damage, which is huge. Um, now, if I had gotten my rocks up there, that would have meant that he would basically already be at almost half HP. But here, again, sticking to the game plan, I put up my Toxic Spikes as he hard swaps out into a Sisuian Samurott. Not wanting to take a Ceaseless Edge to the face, I go back out into my Torkoal, thinking that he would just go immediately for Ceaseless Edge, maybe for Flip Turn. Um, that does do about the damage that I expected, so I don't think that that's um, a Choice Bandit or anything like that. Uh, I was like, should I try to spin these rocks, uh, these spikes away right now? And I decided to go for Lava Plume, expecting him to swap out here. If I called that incorrectly, then I would still have the chance of the burn there. Uh, but I do tag this enamorous swapping in, which felt really good. Uh, if the rocks were up, this thing would have already been dead. So um, no no love for me, enamorous. Um, you're not getting any love for me today. Maybe in the future if I draft you. But for right now, I just need you dead because my Galarian Slow King cannot set up the chili reception with this thing around very easily. But on the other side, it is in range of an ice shard now. So I was looking at my sun turns to determine whom should I go to next. And I decided to stay in thinking that he might go for another moon blast, but he just goes for earth power. So I was happy in the fact that I didn't lose my Galarian Slow King, but I only have three turns of sun left. So that does benefit me in the fact that I can go out into my walking wake here and get the sun boost on my speed. And that means if something is scarfed, I'm gonna outspeed it for the next three turns. Now I here, it was a little bit of a 50-50. I didn't know if he would just go right back into the Mew or if he would try to swap into something else. I knew he was gonna swap out. And so I was really tempted to just click Draco Meteor there. And so he does end up going back out into the Mew. I ran some calcs and it showed that after a round of poison, in the sun with the choice specs, I had a good shot to hit KO him from this range. Uh, you can see that after he comes in and he takes the poison damage and the hydro steam, that looks like a two hit KO. So we're immediately going to take that opportunity and hope for it. And we do knock out the Mew here. This is excellent because if he was assault vested, then I don't have to worry about some weird sort of priority to, that the Mew could carry in the back. And um, I also don't have to worry about trying to force my way through it or muscle through it later. He does go back out into his Hisuian Samurai here. And I was curious if he, the Hisuian Samurai was assault, also assault vested. That seems to be, um, whenever I kind of theory him on, it's, I, I come across a lot of assault vested sets and prep against me in my, in my brain, at least my own brain conjures these sets here. But thinking, Okay, if he goes for a Ceaseless Edge, I can go out and maybe try to recover my HP on my Clefable again. And he does go for Ceaseless Edge, but at this point, I've just been whittled down too much. Really questionable to take that Iron Head earlier. Um, and I still go for it. I, if he tries to do something strange here, I'm gonna get all that HP back. But he does knock out my Clefable while getting all three layers of spikes up. And at this point, my only other heavy duty boots Pokemon is my Galarian Slowking. So I have to kind of gauge here, am I gonna be able to KO this thing? Hisuian Samurai is relatively bulky, but I know I outspeed it with my Zepstrika unless it's Scarfed. Um, if it is Scarfed, then I can take a Ceaseless Edge, 
but then that might let in something else. And then even then I'm trying to go the 50 50 on if I want to go for Supercell Slam. I end up going back out to Walking Wake thinking that I could take a Ceaseless Edge from this range because again, I know he's not Bandit and he's not Life Orb and he's definitely not Black Glasses. He doesn't seem to be any sort of boosting damage on this Samurott. And I also didn't know if he was locked in. And so here I kind of just went for a Hail Mary and it turned out uh, if you go and watch uh, his side of the battle, this was a Scarf Samurott. So I was really confused when I outsped it because I was like, okay, he was playing it like it was Scarfed, but maybe he had a different item. No, he was Scarfed, but I think um, his investment was different from what he expected there. So we do pick up the knockout on it with the Draco Meteor, which was excellent. That's exactly what I wanted to do with Walking Wake is just kind of break there. And he does go out into his Sinistra and I'm not as worried about the Sinistra because uh, I know that it has heavy duty boots. It came in and it didn't get poisoned by the toxic spikes. And so here I have a very easy free swap in to Galarian Slowking. And if he opts to Terra, this is great because I'll immediately be able to hit him up with super effective damage with my coverage moves. And um, I can even set up another layer of toxic spikes if I want, or just go straight for the chili reception. Uh, he does go for Shadow Ball, and as I predicted earlier, with just that much special defense investment in HP, it does not do that much damage. Um, and here I was like, huh, I think I can just click Sludge Bomb. I briefly considered using Chili Reception on this turn, but I really didn't want to bring out Titan into a special move. And he does make a good call and go immediately out into Garchomp. But if the Garchomp was sashed, I accomplished my goal, and that sash is now broken. Now from this range, I did have a chance to live an Earthquake, and I knew I'd live any uh, offensive Dragon type move. It just kind of depended on, um, if, he, if he were max attack, then Earthquake was a really good roll in his favor to kill me, or a guaranteed roll to kill me right there. But if he went for anything else, this is the time. This is what we prep for. This is the time to go for Chili Reception and bring in Titan as he goes for something else. Alternatively, I'm looking at my team and I'm like, oh, I literally have no other play. So <laughs> I had to, I had to click the chili reception here and I had to hope that I lived whatever he went for. He ended up going for scale shot, which I was like, I think I lived that. And I was holding my breath, looking at the hits and he gets four hits, five hits. I had a roll to live as well, but it was again, a roll in his favor. So here, we're gonna tell a bad joke. And we're gonna go out into the Titan with the snow up. Now, of course, with that snow, that means that we get a defense boost. And so, for example, if he had um, offensive max HP, max attack um, Entei, that's doing like 13% in the snow with extreme speed. Um, the Hisuian Samurai is dead, but the same thing with that one. If it's, if it's trying to run Sucker Punch or Aqua Jet, they're doing such piddling damage to me so here this is fantastic because like I, I really didn't see how he got around this if i got up to plus six i shard against his remaining pokemon which were the enamorous this garchomp and his um wait who was the other pokemon that was left the enamorous the garchomp and oh and the sinistra obviously uh, against those Pokemon, all I need is Ice Shard. Literally, I can just Ice Shard from here on out. Um, and so I do get off the Belly Drum, and uh, I was so sad. My controller <laughs> drifted <laughs> and chose Earthquake as I pressed the Confirm button. And so, now that he's at plus one speed, not even my Zebstrika can do anything to help me out here. This video is brought to you by the 8-Bit Doe Ultimate, Ultimate Controller. That's right. You can play any game, anywhere. Switch, Windows, 8-Bit Doe controllers are designed to be as versatile as possible with each of your modern devices. And now, with the two-way mode switch, you can instantly pair your controller via Bluetooth. Ooh. 
Ooh, let's take a look at those texts. Oh, the colorways on the website. I like the red one. Now, this is what it's like when you play with a controller that will not have any drift. Or How do they accomplish now. that? How do they, what kind of, I need to know what demons they put into this thing. Because it, it looks now, like the sticks are all effect me. sticks. We're talking elite control elite. over every piece of this controller. So that way, if there is any failure in the future of my hardware, that means it is my fault. Because now, now we're playing with power. And the 8-bit ultimate software on the PC, Android, and iOS means that I can assign all these buttons. We got the adapter triggers and the vibrations, Whoa, macros that I can assign. I can just put an extra button on the side that's just like, oh yeah, draw a pentagram with the with the control stick and map that to a button. Pentagram power moving forward for the Victorian shadows. This video is not actually brought to you by 8 Uh It is brought to you by um, me. So that was Mondo unfortunate. Did I I don't did I not drink the right juice? No, I brought Galarian Slow King and he set up he set up the hail properly. Did I not have enough vitamins and minerals? No, I put the stealth rocks on the field, and if rocks aren't like rocks are minerals, like that's that's so easy. I don't know. I didn't I, I guess I didn't bring Venusaur. That's my vegetables. Is that what I did wrong here? Like I was so sad to see <laughs> And it was a type of thing that happened in slow motion. Like I went to click A, and, then, and my controller was just like, Boop. as I was clicking it, I was like, I think I just clicked earthquake. And so he sweeps me from here. Um, I do think that if my, uh, oh, um, hey, I got a new controller. I ordered one literally right after this battle. So I have a brand new controller as the 8-bit ultimate. Uh, the 8 bit do ultimate, which has hall effect sticks. Um, this video is not sponsored by 8 bit do, but those sticks can't drift. There aren't any physical pieces inside of the controller to rub and wear down and to have drift. So I don't have to worry about the drift from those. And that's awesome. Shroom, thank you for the battle, sir. I love battling you every single time that we get to battle, and it's so cool and surreal that we get to battle here in 2024. Um, but uh, that means that it is mandatory that we win the next battle. So I am going to go summon some power. Thank you all for watching. I am so dismayed about my controller. <laughs> but it's it's kind of funny, but also it's kind of not. But um, I hope you all enjoyed the battle, and I look forward to seeing you all next week for a new battle. Next week we are going up against Q, the Costa Rican, and the Chicago Pulse. And um, man, so looking forward to that battle with my brand new controller. I wonder if I can find something in like a red color, like a bloody red color. Yeah, I already ordered it. I already got it. It's coming. It's coming. Now I'm just waxing lyrical. You can't be salty about these things though. Like technically that was something in my control, but <sighs> could it not have just dri And it was funny because it was drifting earlier in the battle, <laughs> but I was like waiting before each time and that one, it just like drifted right out anyways. You probably noticed in the in the footage that I kept like cycling through moves a lot. That was that should have been my key. That should have been the cue. The the kef the, the clef key. The Q the kef key. I don't know. Leave your controller recommendations in the comments. Um, for those of you who are still here, hi, how's it going? It's cool that we're hanging out here after the battle together. It kind of feels like uh there's confetti on the ground because the other team won and the coach already went in and the team already went inside and you're just standing out on the field in the rain. You're just, you're just like, ah, we were right there. We were right there. But then, you know, someone notices that you're out there and they're like, hey man, come on, we're going to go get hot dogs or whatever. I don't know. What do they eat after the big game? I don't know. 
But then you know you go to the next game. And it's all good. I'll talk to you guys next time. Goodbye.